Okay. We're recording. Great. Thank you. This is the second of nine weekly Groundfish seminars running through December 13th. Since we are all doing the seminar remotely, the speaker will use an electronic pointer or be descriptive when indicating specific points on the slides. To help with this format and avoid additional distractions, please mute your audio and turn off your video feed during the seminar. Also, please keep your questions for the end of the seminar, or if you think you might forget them, you can type them into the chat box. Liz, Bianca, Sarah, and I will compile them for the end of the seminar. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind people to join us for next week's speaker, Thaddeus Buser from the Groundfish Assessment Program at the Alaska Fishery Science Center. And he will talk about Stags of the Sea on the evolution and function of cranial weapons and sculpins, which will be held at the same time next Tuesday, October 18th. Today's speaker is James Thorson. He leads the Habitat and Ecological Processes Research Program at the AFSC, which involves envisioning future research and partnerships regarding essential fish habitat and loss of sea ice. He hopes to encourage further synthesis of direct and indirect impacts of fishing on population status and productivity. He also collaborates with researchers in all AFSC divisions to integrate monitoring, process research, and modeling efforts to respond to ongoing changes in climate and resulting habitat. And today, Jim will be talking about using phylogenetic comparative methods of ground fishes in the Gulf of Alaska, and then using those trait estimates to identify habitat associations. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. Should I just jump in? Um, please feel free to interrupt if, I, if I'm cutting you off. Um, and thanks to you and, and Liz for organizing the Groundfish Seminar, which is obviously one of the key um, you know, seminars that the Alaska Fishery Science Center has. So um, as Mark said, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I, uh, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to close stuff. So um, as I never tire of um, pointing out, I've got sort of in the back of my office here, I've got a, a, a sawfish rostrum that comes to me by way of my grandfather, who was an ichthyologist. And um, I always grew up sort of fascinated looking at that and trying to think about how, um, you know, functional morphology affects kind of habitat utilization and the prospects for species. That um, rostrum comes from the Nicaraguan subpopulation, Lake Nicaragua, that was extirpated and um, sawfish, like many long-lived sharks, you know, is very vulnerable to over exploitation and so there's sort of this clear link from morphology to um, ecology and, and and fisheries management today i'll be talking um highlighting a few papers and noting co-authors as i go and basically the main message is about um first about phylogenetic comparative methods which are a, a powerful tool that's widely used in ecology but hasn't really made the jump over into fisheries science is the way it should um, and then trying to think about how those um, phylogenetic comparative methods can be used to better understand species habitat. So, like I said, um, the first part of this is, you know, it's easier to explain by kind of using other people's work, of course. And the first is this paper that just came out um, in this issue of Methods in Ecology and Evolution that's using what they call phylogenetic factor analysis. Um, so essentially specifying in this, on the right-hand side, this is showing um, all mammals and a, you know, the most complete phylogeny, like an ultrametric, um, an ultrametric phylogeny of mammals, and then different factors, so sort of dominant axes of trait coevolution, where each of those factors is associated with different measurable traits in the top. So like, for instance, the first factor is associated with longer gestation length, higher age at weaning, higher age at dispersal, and so on. So the first axis is sort of a slow to fast um, axis of trait coevolution. And the second piece here is this, this paper, an ecology letters paper by um, Ovaskainen's lab and um, Tikhanov, sort of a Scandinavian group using joint species distribution models um, this is a great review paper from a couple years ago, basically pointing out in the top right that we often have, um, you know, samples of occurrence or density for different sampling units. That's the top left box in the top right of the slide. For every sampling unit, we have the environment. 
Um, for every species, we have a species by species covariance that you, we can get from phylogeny. And then we also have a species by traits matrix. And so, you know, if you drop out phylogeny, this used to be um, three of those four boxes and, and people called this the fourth corner problem where you try to infer a trait by environment association. Um, you know, these days, I think we also acknowledge that, you know, there's phylogeny in the mix here. And so people try to understand sort of how um, evolution sets up sort of the, 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 the traits that are capable of defining a species or individual's response to its environment and using these different sorts of information to improve inference about habitat utilization and how much of the variance in habitat utilization could be explained by interannual variation, site level random effects, um, you know, persistence and environmental drivers which is shown in this one of many examples in that paper for, for different birds in ponds. So essentially I'll be trying to talk about sort of efforts to um, implement both of these concepts in fisheries. So um, digging in first for phylogenetic structural equation models, this is sort of a, um, a term that we are currently trying to publish and revisions are in review at Methods in College Evolution. Um, it's a paper that includes, well, it came out of this Fish Globe Consortium that was funded by the Canadian and French embassies led by Bastien, um, yeah, Bastien Marigot. And um, that came out of a working group led by Aurore Moreau, Romain Freyla, and Lorraine Picochet. And notably, um, Jen Jenny Bigman and Sarah Friedman, who are co-authors, are both here at the Alaska Center. And I feel lucky to get to work with them. So. Um, Phylogenetic, compar phylogenetic comparative methods and phylogenetic structural equation modeling is specifically concerned with how do you how do you assimilate all of this information about traits? And we've been doing this in in what they've called phylogenetic factor analysis. We've been doing this for almost you know almost a decade in fisheries. Um, so in terms of databases, we have FishBase for life history parameters. We have the Ram Meyer stock recruitment database. We have behavioral and diet information in FishBase 2. We have the Dalka and Portner databases of um, lab measurements of climate responses. We have morphometrics information from Price and Wainwright. We have bioenergetics that you know the Alaska Center and many others develop, but I'm not aware of a centralized, you know, and modern database containing it. And then there's EcoBase for like ecotrophic efficiency and, and ecosystem modeling. Um, and, you know, if you're going to think about this kind of zoo of traits, um, people have proposed to divide it into behavioral and life history, morphology, diet, and physiology. And um, essentially, you know, we'll be trying to look at traits across all five of these attributes. So um, in version one of fish lice that came out of earlier sort of hierarchical and phylogenetic methods, but it was the first that, that used phylogenetic factor analysis um, that I'm aware of. We, um, we, we brought in all of fish base information and used taxonomy to build and to approximate a phylogeny, a phylogenetic tree. Um, and in this, we looked at, um, you know, from class to order to family to genus to species, what's the predictive distribution of the ratio of mortality to individual growth rate? So. Um, as you go from the top to the bottom, you get this sort of Brownian motion in this this M over K ratio on a log scale on the X axis. And for instance, by family, I start highlighting that Sebastidae has a lower M over K um, by the time you get to, um, actually, I, I think I mislabeled that. I think it's supposed to be Scorpionidae. Um, and that was a typo in the paper, but um, of course I'm a rockfish person, so I, I, I just renamed the family. Anyway, um, Sebastes being, I think, the leftmost of these, and then there's a bunch of rockfishes that have an M over K lower than one. You know, this comes up all the time, like, for instance, in the Alaska Center presentation, the plan team recently, where there was attempts to infer M from K and L infinity, and rockfishes have a totally different relationship between M over K, presumably due to their morphology. They're, they're sort of large body size and their spines and so on. And so this was a big deal for, for me because I had published a previous meta-analysis using um, stock assessment models um, off the West Coast 
um, developing sort of a predictive distribution for every stock assessment and fitting an M over K. And for those West Coast rockfishes, the average ratio of M over K is about one. That conflicts with the sort of assumed value of 1.5 that's made often. And so this sort of phylogenetic factor analysis gave some intuition about why, you know, corroboration that, that rockfishes are different than other species. Um, in FishBase version two, we added the RAM legacy stock recruit database and, for instance, can do the same Brownian motion model on steepness. Steepness is technically derived from, from the exchangeable parameter, which is the lifetime spawners per spawner. Um, and, you know, and then using this Mengel approximation for FMSY over M, so this is how you calculate a reference point for fishing mortality at maximum sustainable yield. That's sort of derived directly from steepness, the steepness of the stock recruit function. And so if you fit a Brownian motion model on steepness, you can again see that um, Scorpionidae, um, Sebastes, or a bunch of rockfishes typically have lower steepness, at least in the original RAM legacy database, than other taxa. And so again, we're, you know, this is sort of a phylogenetic factor analysis model. And both of the references on, uh, are on the left. So the goal of um, in Fish Globe was to, well, there were three goals. One was to include categorical traits. So a lot of habitat, reproductive, behavioral, and spawning traits are classified as categories, not as continuous values. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback about fish life where people want to understand what's happening in the predictions. They don't just want a model, a black box model. They want to understand what trait is driving what trait and why a species is predicted to have the value it does. And to do that, I've wanted to replace correlations with regression slopes to make it look more like a regression model that people are familiar with. And then I've also wanted to improve parsimony. So these, these um, as, as people, as the recent sort of terminology about phylogenetic factor analysis that came somewhat after fish life, as that literature has pointed out, these model, these fa phylogenetic factor models have a lot of parameters. And so it becomes really hard to fit 30 traits or 50 traits or 80 traits, you know, to actually get the full range of, of trait values um, imputed for all fish. And so we want to make more, more, a more parsimonious um, phylogenetic trait imputation method so that we can bring in, like for instance, ecosystem traits. So in terms of categorical traits, there's gonna be some equations here. Um, we basically take a, um, an indicator, like a, a factor in our terminology and convert that to a indicator matrix, like a matrix of zeros and ones. Um, and then we transform it to this matrix of zeros or negative values where the negative is this log of a delta and the delta equals a, um, a priori assumption about a false positive rate. And um, basically the model can fit those exactly and it ends up being like a Brownian bridge where it um, has uncertainty as you go from, you know, if you have a measurement for a species it pr predicts your data exactly. But if you go to the genus, it has an increasing variance. If you have a species with no data, it predicts off the predictive distribution. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, that's a bit like, like for instance, an Ives model for um, a continuous time Markov chain for traits. This instead is sort of assuming a false positive rate and makes it computationally much faster than um, and more like a generalized linear model than the, the previous kind of categorical methods, either that Felsenstein or Ives have developed. Um, the next part is, um, I think, easier to explain by, again, looking at other people's work. So this is um, an ecology letters paper that um, was trying to use traits to think about energy budgets for plants. And so, you know, there's sort of this um, presumed trade-off between um, leaf traits, you know, so like depending on the nitrogen concentration that would affect the photosynthetic rate. I think the idea is that there's higher nitrogen in leaf, thicker leaves, and that thick leaves might have a longer lifespan. And so there's sort of three different, this guy Shipley originally developed three different sort of quote intuitive models for how, um, in this case, um, leaf mass per area being 
you know, might drive nitrogen concentration and might drive photosynthetic rate, it might drive lifespan, or a, alternatively, you might think a, a different set of causal assumptions that um, there's sort of an exogenous covariance between leaf mass and nutrient nitrogen, like desert plants having higher for both of them. Those together, together driving um, photosynthetic rate and then that driving leaf lifespan. So both of these are admissible kind of causal assumptions about evolutionary trade-offs. And um, in this originally original Shipley paper, they concluded that neither of those fit the data well, and they instead posited this sort of latent variable that was driving all of them. Um, this Ecology Letters paper in 2015 came along and fitted these phylopath, phylogenetic path analysis models and concluded, no, that um, this intuitive model number one is, is a sufficient description of, of, fish, of uh, plant traits, um, which they call the leaf economic spectrum. So, you know, th this is sort of like a very serious sort of thought about how do um, traits drive one another in a different taxa. We haven't done this exercise, I don't think, I'm not aware of it in, in fish uh, previously. So how do you do, how do you generalize this? Well, path analysis, the way people have done it is based on this sort of um, Judea Pearl, like de-separation literature that just fits a bunch of phylogenetic linear models. And you can generalize that by, by kind of going back to first principles about structural equation models. So a structural equation model looks like this at the top. You've got a set of a vector of traits, X, and those result from one another from this sort of endogenous process that's represented by a bunch of linear path coefficients that I'm just gonna use gamma um, based on um, Kaplan and other, other, people, other people's notation. So um, if you have this endogenous path coefficients gamma, and then you've got some exogenous drivers epsilon, and epsilon has this um, multivariate normal distribution with covariance sigma, then that specifies what's called a structural equation model. And if you just do some basic linear algebra, you can rearrange to get um, that the variance of X, which we'll call V, has this form, and it's, um, you know, it's just a quadratic, it's a quadratic form, they call this, um, where you have to invert an identity matrix minus the path coefficients. And in a traditional structural equation model, you would complete this model by specifying a likelihood. In this case, the the variant, the observed variance of your, you, you have to assume that you've got perfect measurements of all traits. That gets you an observed variance, and that follows a Wishart distribution. And that's how, like, you can perfectly replicate the package SEM. Um, that's how structural equation modeling has always worked, you know, going back like a hundred years to, to, to original work. Um, so we can take that insight, we can build that covariance from a path diagram and then embed it in a larger model. And in this case, we're going to embed it in a evolutionary model, you know, like a phylogenetic uh, model where we have to specify a evolutionary model. So um, the simplest one is Brownian motion, and that's what Felsenstein started with and what I mean, I, you know, that's what I started with in the phylogenetic factor analysis. I didn't know about phylogenetic comparative methods until recently, but I guess I, you know, it's just sort of reinventing what's a pretty intuitive idea. Um, and where D is the evolutionary distance between a, a parent taxon and a child taxon. You could also have an ornstein uhlenbeck process or an OU process. That's like a mean reverting evolutionary process where the autoregression um, row is calculated from distance and an autocorrelation rate theta and tau um, is calculated similarly. And like I, I do this in stream network models, you know, the OU is sort of a basic, um, you know, part of a statistical ecologist tool, toolkit. Um, and then there's sort of this vocab that's sort of specific to phylogenetic models, including um, like Pagel's delta and kappa, rapid burst and breakpoint models. and all of these are are easy extensions of these sort of um, file, these sort of conditional autoregressive formulations of a of a of an evolutionary model. So um, if you put this in in into an SE, if you combine these two things, you combine an SEM, a structural equation model, and phylogenetic methods, you get a bunch of benefits. And you know, so one of them is that you derive the covariance between traits from a bunch of linear 
trade-offs like causal interpretations of evolutionary trade-offs. You can include latent variables and that's not possible in the previous phylogenetic path analysis. You can estimate covariances in exogenous drivers like that Shipley model. You can specify parameter equality. So you might, you know, for parsimony, you want to assume that, um, you know, some parameters are equal. You can have these effect loops where X causes Y, causes Z, causes X, and that's not possible in a phylogenetic factor, uh, phylogenetic path analysis. And then you can also compute, once you have a, a, a graph, you can compute direct and indirect effects. So like if you have Z that's caused by both the effect of X and Y, but Y is being caused by X, then there's a direct, there's a direct path of X to Z, but there's an indirect path of X to Y to Z. And um, that becomes important in trying to think about causal experiments. Like if we have an uncontrolled experiment of warming the water, um, we need to think about these mechanisms explicitly to try to use phylogenetic comparative methods to work out what's going to happen under climate change. And I'm just using the package SEM, you know, input formats. So you just specify every one of the path coefficients, like in this case, temperature, you know, I'm going to assume drives the log of asymptotic body size, the log of relative growth coefficient, the log of mortality. And you just write out all of your, all of your causal assumptions or the um, trait associations as path coefficients. So what that looks like is this sort of structure where at the top, you've got these sort of, um, you've got a, a phylogenetic pre, whether from taxonomy or, or, you know, molecular methods, like on a, a dated chronogram, ultrametric phylogeny, whatever. Um, and then you've got measurements of different traits that, you know, trait one and two and three are continuous and the, you know, three, you've only got one measurement across this tree and then trait four might be categorical with different modalities um, measured in some traits. And then you, um, you specify the trait associations as a structural equation model um, using that format. And that results in this gamma matrix having a certain structure. And, um, you know, you might, you, you know, this might in, in particular, you know, be a set of causal assumptions about how temperature and body size plays out in fish or in birds. Um, and it results in this, um, in this, gamma matrix and then a resulting trait covariance. And with that trait covariance and the tree, you can, you can um, estimate all of those path coefficients and then impute all the missing values across your whole tree, including ancestors. And that's basically how you can kind of merge phylogenetic inference and imputation. So, um, you know, to prove that we know what we're doing, we do a simulation experiment. And um, in this case, we're going to simulate sort of a, a phylogenetic linear model where we've got a covariate that undergoes Brownian motion. We've got a exogenous driver that under, you know, also follows a Brownian motion model with a simulated tree. And we fit a linear model, a phylogenetic linear model, or a phylogenetic structural equation model under two scenarios, either complete data or 60% of data missing. And if we do that, that we simulated a true slope of one, um, on the left-hand side, if we have no missing data, so this zero panel on the left-hand side, the, the phylo, phylogenetic linear model and the fish life, this phylogenetic structural equation model, both are tightly clustered around the true value of one. The uncorrected linear model has much worse performance in that case. If there's 60% missing data, the um, fish life method in red ends up being a little bit better than phylogenetic, the Philo LM package because um, fish life is doing trait imputation, whereas Philo LM is not. And so it's able to use um, incomplete trait records more, you know, more efficiently than Philo LM. And again, the, the normal linear model does the worst in, in both these cases. So um, in terms of a real application, we, we assembled this sort of database of 53 variables um, across 34,000 fish taxa, and reduced it down to um, 11 continuous variables, four categorical or factor variables, so spawning type, habitat, feeding mode, and body shape, 
that results in, you know, after expanding factors to indicator matrices, it results in 26 modeled variables. And if we fit this and then plot the output as a structural, you know, as a path diagram, we get this. This is sort of the new um, fish life model of um, trait evolution. So here we're structuring it with temperature as sort of the base of this causal, um, you know, we're assuming temperature is sort of an exogenous driver for, um, for taxa. And that then it that's driving um, asymptotic body size for you know adult body size, and then that radiates out to all these traits, um, you know. So that's sort of like a size structured theory of of fish traits, like Ken Anderson or other people talk about. Um, you know, growth coefficient goes out to maturation choices. Um, mortality goes to age max. Aspect ratio radiates out in turn to a bunch of these sort of morphometric measurements that the Price and Wainwright lab with Sarah Friedman and others have, have been measuring. And then asymptotic weight radiates out to these kind of you know, body trophic level, but also um, reproductive traits. And so you can see that like, for instance, as in temperature increases, you get a decreased asymptotic body size temperature as temperature increases you get a increased mortality rate and increased growth relative growth rate um those lead to a negative you know faster faster growth leads to um earlier age of maturity um and so on let's see earlier length of maturity some of these numbers are hard to read with a with a kind of complicated path figure but um Obviously, higher natural mortality leads to an earlier maximum age, and that's sort of the, you know, the kind of Hamel, Cope, Fenn, Honig methods for using age max to infer natural mortality rate. Um, you, there's a bunch of these factor valued traits, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about them, but um, like as you get a larger body size, the model thinks that fish get a, a slightly higher aspect ratio. There's a close to allometric relationship from asymptotic length to asymptotic weight. And then those kind of matriculate through to increased fecundity, increased offspring size, and higher trophic level. So, so that's essentially this sort of, um, you know, for a stab at, um, at, at, at sort of a, a trait model of parameters and morphometrics in fishes. Um, and it reflects sort of a priori assumptions about evolutionary mechanisms, but then the parameter values are fitted to data. We could do a bunch of model selection in the future. And I think this is a huge potential topic of, of, of future research, obviously. Um, we haven't previously in phylogenetic factor models, you know, using fish life done a bunch of cross validation. So this, we did this a fourfold cross validation for continuous traits like maximum age, trophic level, we get this percent variance explained from like 50 to 90% across all of these traits. And some are harder to predict like trophic level or aspect ratio. Others are easier to predict like a lot of the um, fecundity length, um, weight sort of, um, and some of the morphometrics and mortality is harder to predict. Um, looking at categorical traits, well, some continuous and then mainly categorical. We're using area under the receiver operator characteristics curve to evaluate success. That's like a sensitivity specificity trade off. It's a standard metric and binary indicator predictions where a value of one is good. And a lot of these have an AUC of close to 100. You know, so there's a ton of information in um, phylogeny about um, garter, you know, reproductive. Um, behaviors like garters, non-garters, um, habitat associations, although pelagic is relatively bad, or, or body shape. Um, yeah. Um, and then, you know, we wanted to ask, you know, what can we do with this to identify life history strategies? So we extract the imputed trait matrix and apply what's called archetypal analysis as an R package. So we model the extracted tra imputed traits is a mixture of different estimated archetypes and plot those archetype archetypes. And so if we do 
Um, you know, if we do like a scree plot, we just, you know, we conclude that three archetypes is enough and they, you know, you know, it plops out that we get essentially the, the Weinmiller rose typology. So labeling those, we've got opportunistic, you know, and, and there's a lot of phylogenetic uh, signal in this, you know, just like Weinmiller and Rose pointed out like 30 years ago. So um, opportunistic in Weinmiller Rose terminology is like the gobies. Um, and those species have a, a very small age, like a low maximum age, um, very, very rapid relative growth, very high mortality. They're often bears, you know, because Ken Anderson points out that they can't, they're so small that they can't shrink their offspring enough and so they invest a lot in them. Um, you know, then there's these kind of periodic species that are illustrated by clupeids. Periodic have sort of intermediate maximum age, um, but relatively high fecundity. They're the most extreme in terms of fecundity. Um, often have short and deep bodies, planktivorous. Um, yeah, being pelagic or reef associated. And then, and then finally, there's sort of equilibrium, which is sharks, and there's no surprise there about fishes, you know, that typically have the largest body size, um, largest length, highest trophic level. Um, they're likely to be generalists, or, you know, or, or I'm sorry, they're likely to be um, fe feeding mode of macrofauna. Um, and, and then there's a bunch of these sort of intermediate, so like Scorpionidae, um, finally remembering that Sebastidae is not a, not a thing, um, is sort of intermediate in the middle. Sa salmon are kind of between periodic and equilibrium. Perches are between equilibrium and opportunistic and so on. So this, in all of those are sort of lined up in the Weinmiller rose um, the way they described 30 years ago, but now we can actually predict the Weinmiller rose strategy for all 34,000 described species of fish. So, um, you know, many people that I've talked to over the years about, you know, what I now understand is, is phylogenetic factor analysis, um, you know, thinking fish globe consortium and in particular, you know, these kind of ongoing discussions with, with Ruter von, von der Bijl at UBC, um, and maybe I'll get to that at the end. Um, and Steve Munch was in, instrumental in, in, in me thinking this stuff through. Um, and it also came, came out of some work that Daniel, Polly, and Reiner Froza and I started. Um, yeah, so. Um, and then the next, the next piece is a, a second paper that's in uh, Revisions and Review and Ecography. Uh, it's work that, that Cheryl Barnes, you know, started during her postdoc and um, has been absolutely instrumental in, in doing. Um, also with Sarah Friedman again, Janelle Morano, who's a PhD student at Cornell, and Megzi um, Sippel, who also is a, you know, a new FTE at GAP and, and very lucky to have her. Um, and yeah, so this one's called Spatially Varying Coefficient Models Can Improve Ecological Inferences from Species Distribution Models. So, um, so it's, a, it's sort of a, you know, best practice, you know, it's a good practices guide about spatially varying coefficients. And so taking another kind of step back to methods before we talk about the ecological interpretation, um, you know, we have a generalized linear model where you, you have a link function here. I'm just showing a log link. And the linear, the log link linear predictor on the right-hand side of that top equation, and then you specify a response distribution. Um, that data fall, you know, or hypothesized to follow some distribution based on that linear predictor. In in spatial models like S, species distribution models that we use at Alaska Center across the board and all divisions and go into stock assessments like the Pollock and Cod assessment, um, you know, all of our measured habitat explains some portion of variation, but there's residual, there's unmeasured top-down drivers like predator avoidance, there's prey availability. The SDMs that we have explain a portion of distribution, but not all of it. And so there's this spatially variant, you know, the residual processes that are unmodeled are themselves spatially correlated. And there's sort of endogenous dynamics that cause spatial correlations. And so both of these cause um, residuals to be spatially correlated. And you can sop those up and condition on those by treat, doing the spatially varying intercept models. So you take the intercept alpha and make it 
vary by space, like as a Gaussian process. Ideally as a Gaussian process, but in, in GAMS often as a spline that I don't think works as well. Um, so we do a lot of these spatially varying intercept models and that's like how we do essential fish habitat um, and, and, and model-based index creation for stock assessment. Um, we also, um, alternatively, what we don't do very much is these spatially varying slope models. So we could instead um, start exploring these cases where the response to a covariate um, itself varies spatially. And you can do that in the package MGCV using this, um, this by term. So it's easy to do in, in MGCV or other packages, but I'll be doing the, re the remainder of this stuff in fast because I, well, I, I trust the smoother is more than the smoother options that are available in MGCV. So um, there's sort of seven questions that I think ecologists typically face that can be addressed with spatially varying uh, coefficient models. So, you know, for instance, like do regional indices like the PDO or the, you know, it, um, Arctic oscillation, do they affect, how do they affect local densities? You can put a regional index into a model and have a spatially varying response. There's, does density dependence affect local habitat utilization? You can put in a time series of total abundance. Does sampling have variable performance across habitat? You could put an indicator variable for sampling gear to intercalibrate that. Do environmental responses vary spatially? Like, you know, for instance, does, um, you know, preference for rocky habitat vary with the abundance of predators? So you could put in a local environmental variable with spatially varying response. I think for some indicators, we might want a decadal trend model. So, you know, showing stakeholders, what's the, what's the trend in distribution over the last five years? You can put in this spline basis expansion of time with a spatially varying response. And then finally, I mean, I, I'll walk through these final three, but do traits explain species specific habitat utilization? You can put in trait values like we've been talking about earlier. And then there's sort of this question about cohorts having different habitat usage, um, which we'll also talk about. So um, the first example that I'll walk through are decadal trends. Are there decadal trends in local density? Um, we can just use this splines two package to generate an I spline, like an integrated, um, like a like a random walk spline, let's call it. Um, so in this case, we put in um, that we want it defined over 1982 through 2019 um, with four degrees of freedom. And that essentially approximates sort of like each of these trends is sort of the trend over about a 10 year block of that interval. And if we fit that to arrowtooth flounder, we, um, we get that sort of their average prior to any of this happening, their average distribution might have looked like this. Their trend in the 80s was towards higher utilization in the southern portion of the middle domain. Their trend later was in the northern portion of the middle domain. And then finally, by the most recent 10 years, they've really colonized, intensively colonized sort of the 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 northern and middle part of the middle domain. And so um, you know, when I when I think about Aratooth, I sort of um, you know, I'm used to looking at annual estimates of habitat utilization, and I think of them as moving offshore to inshore. I don't think I'd really understood that they their colonization of new habitats really accelerated, um, you know, from 2007 onward, say. Um, do cohorts have different habitat utilization? So we could put in a cohort indicator variable in VAST. And this is relevant because, like, um, you know, I understand that Troy Buckley was really interested in this and, and Dwayne Stevenson re recently read, led a paper on this at CJFAS, with a link here. Um, so Troy and, and Dwayne's hypothesis is that, you know, Pollock as they, as they age have this sort of ontogenic habitat shift where they start out inshore and they essentially kind of move counterclockwise on average. So, um, you know, and, and basically Dwayne, you know, this paper that Dwayne and Stan and, um, um, you know, uh, we all collaborated on, um, you know, we, after controlling for age effects, 
we identified sort of a significant cohort effect. Um, but, you know, I was sort of interested during that and trying to visualize that cohort effect and it was sort of too, um, too far, you know, too sort of too big of a leap from the sort of analysis we'd already been doing, but we started estimating this in VAST and, um, and so let's see, I, I can't actually see on my screen the top row, it's obscured by the sort of share panel, but, um, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so it just moved. So, so the 81 cohort is sort of has distinct habitat utilization towards the southern outer domain. Um, the 96 cohort has sort of more of the um, a persistent signal in the kind of northern middle domain. And then by the time you get to 2015 cohort, there's estimated to be this really hot, hot spot that it kind of relative to other cohorts and age effects tends to prefer this sort of northern um, portion of the eastern Bering Sea. So, um, you know, we've kind of independent lines of evidence that these cohort effects matter for Pollock, and it's it's relevant because cohort effects can be forecasted. This is what Jimmy and Ellie and Cole do in their assessments is forecast, I think Cole does this, um, is forecast cohort effects and weighted age. Um, in this case, we could forecast cohort effects for habitat utilization, and that would potentially give us some skill in short-term forecasting of um, like predator prey overlap for use in something like a climb or or something else that's that's more focused on short-term kind of tactical uh, spatial management. Then finally, this sort of do traits explain species specific distribution. You know, this is a super long walk for a short drink, but um, you know, again, kind of knowing that we've got these sort of trait estimates for all taxa, you know, 34,000 fish, we can just extract out 16 taxa from the Gulf of Alaska. And each of them is estimated to have its own distinct habitat utilization. But across them, we also share these sort of trait effects and visualize the estimated values here. Um, so that, you know, these hierarchical models like VAST have sort of a shrinkage, a regularization, and it's sort of penalizing out of the model the trophic level term. So trophic level is not thought to have any effect um, for these kind of major dominant kind of ground fishes in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, but age max does seem to have the signal where species with higher maximum age tend to have higher density off the, um, you know, shelf break going into deeper waters. Um, a higher temperature is associated with higher densities for species that are warm water associated and the opposite for cold water associated. So, um, you know, as you get to the, the passes, you tend to transition to a more cold water community is what it's saying. And then similarly, um, maximum length has, um, you know, longer bodied species tend to have higher density in, in these areas in, in, in the central and then into the Western Gulf Alaska. So that's sort of the, um, this sort of trait by space association, getting back to that original question of how do traits modulate habitat utilization? This is sort of, um, you know, the, est the, the sort of initial estimate for the Gulf Alaska. I certainly don't think this is the final word for anything, but it's sort of a proof of concept that we can, we can do these sort of trait by space maps to better understand how traits modulate species responses to their environment. So, um, you know, thanks to handling editor ecography, three anonymous reviewers, um, Stan and Dwayne for the cohort analysis discussions that led to this, you know, Stan and Eric for technical reviews, and then again, the co-authors. So, um, so where do we go from here? I'm, I'm hoping to have some time for questions, but um, I think one topic is broad adoption of phylogenetic conditional predictions, like phylogenetic comparative methods in general and fisheries. I don't claim to, um, you know, full, really understand why ecology as a whole has really used phylogenetic comparative methods a lot and fisheries in general does not. Um, but I think there's a huge amount to be gained by us adapting phylogenetic comparative methods and phylogenetic trade imputation. And then um, the next is the, you know, basically evaluating impacts for data poor distributional studies. So 
We've got a lot of data poor species. We do data poor stock assessments for those, but data poor kind of habitat assessment, data poor SDMs is, um, you know, something that will need to, I think, grow as a field. So um, I've really only got an answer for the first, you know, kind of initial work on the first of these. And so the second one will just be left as sort of a topic that I'd love to discuss after the talk. For the first one, and I might, if, if I have time and there's no questions, I might share a little bit of code for sort of the follow up. So um, all the stuff I showed is using fish life, this sort of third update of fish life. And at this point, it's a very, you know, it's a bit like vast. It's sort of been de designed as a um, Swiss army knife to do a lot of stuff. And um, as I've learned from SDM TMB, you know, some users don't want as many features. They just want a simplified interface. And so, um, you know, the goal is to um, to develop this sort of sim simplified interface, Philo SEM. Um, you know, it basically has two kind of core logical functions and then a bunch of core statements. And it's a fast and simple R package for phylogenetic inference. We're kind of preparing this as an application notes for bioinformatics, me and this, this postdoc, um, Vuter at, at UBC. So, um, again, the input format is a tree with ape and a structural equation model using SEM. The output can then be coerced to a phylo path or a phylo LEM or a phylo 4D or an SEM object and plotted using those. And so um, on the right-hand side, this is just using PhiloPath has this loaded data set Rhino that has a bunch of traits. And in this case, I'm specifying a, a, a model where I forget even what these codes mean. Um, DD leads to RS, BM leads to LS, BM leads to NL, and NL leads to DT. And so these are all um, the arrows, these kind of one-sided arrows that are then plotted um, after converting it to a fitted DAG, which is this object from PhiloPath. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's as simple to run as a Philo LM or like a linear model in R. Um, and, and thinking about Philo SM, you know, and this is true of Fish Life too, it's sort of the only um, package that would have sort of this set of, of five desiderata, um, five, sort of useful features. Um, so, you know, like Philo SEM and SEM both can include latent variables, but our Philo PARs and Philo PATH and Philo LM can't. Um, predicting traits conditional upon phylogenetic information, Philo SEM and our Philo PARs do that. Um, a bunch of these use um, estimate regression coefficients as slope parameters, but Philo PARs doesn't. Um, and then three of these estimate multiple dependencies using a path diagram. So it can like have indirect and direct effects. Um, and so, yeah, Philo SEM would be the first to do this. Um, it also is comparable in speed to any of these other specialized packages. So, um, and I've, I've got a script that I've, I've got a private repo with a doc, you know, an R package that I plan to put up in CRAN. Um, you know, showing that I can get to the, you know, third or sixth decimal place in identical answer to these other R packages that are all sort of kind of core tools for phylogenetic comparative methods. Um, and I was just doing, the, I was just testing this out. So there was sort of this recent publication, Hassler et al, that did phylogenetic comparative methods using a joint GIB sampler and comparing that with HMC. And, you know, this sort of TMB method is about a thousand times faster. So I can fit in about two minutes, I can fit um, all of, you know, a, a tree of about 4,000 um, mammal species with eight traits. And, um, you know, I get this sort of standard plot using Philo 4D um, shown here. Uh, so it's, you know, it's the kind of Philo SEM, basically for people that are interested in phylogenetic comparative methods, or um, trait, trait uh, predicting trait values or life history parameters. This is something that I'd be happy to share and start collaborating on, and I hope it'll be on CRAN within a, within the year. So um, with that, I just want to thank again, you know, Mark and Liz Dawson for I as I as I understand it, having led the Groundfish seminar since 2017. It's 
um, a tremendous resource that that links across the Alaska Center. And I, as I understand it, they're handing it over to Sarah Friedman and Bianca. Um, and and thank you to you both as well for for taking that on. Um, so that's it. And I'd be happy to take questions if there's time. Well, thank you, Tim. And we're going to hand it over to uh, Sarah and Bianca to field questions. And um, they'll be looking at the chat. And people can raise hands, or if you unmute your microphone, it promotes you to the top, so you're a lot more visible. Are there any questions? Hey, Jim, why don't I ask you a question? You ready? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great. Great. Um, very interesting stuff. So my question is pretty broad. Do you have all the data you need? <laughs> if not, what would you prioritize to help you? So 100%, I, I'd say that's the biggest effort, and I would love to collaborate on that. So. People at the Alaska Center know that I've been really hassling a variety of groups about trying to figure out what we have. You know, like for instance, we we have a, a chemistry group, Rika, that has a wealth of uh, bioenergetic information that um, you know Kristen uh, Kirsten Holzman has sort of standardized and uses to parameterize uh, you know trophic models, and so it's used operationally for stock assessment. But a lot of times if we, like, for instance, come chalk and flounder, if that's a prey, we've just chosen to make up that it has the same bomb calorimetry as Aratooth flounder. That's a sort of very simple type of trait imputation. And we could do that more formally with using kind of these formal methods. So I'd like to assemble all of the bioenergetic information. I'd love to assemble the eco base. You know, from EWE, you know, Ecopath with Ecosim to interface with RPATH. Um, there's so many interesting, you know, there's the larval duration, like Laurel Bradbury data set, and a lot of, you know, like Lorenzo's kind of climate vulnerability work is all premised on sort of larval duration and um, adaptability. And, and so there's so many of these interesting questions that I think could be addressed with collaborative work to assemble trade information and look for kind of cross correlations between or you know how traits are associated um in different tax i'd love to collaborate on it okay sounds like a lot of work still to do thanks <laughs> yeah and 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 rich i i think i saw that it was you rich mcbride and tell me if i'm wrong i, I you know i 100% i'd love to you know i think i think you presumably are still leaving the the marvels uh cross science center you know group that looks at um reproductive traits and and maturation and um i'd love to connect with you guys more yeah well marvels will be meeting with uh ensaw in may oh, and fun. so i hope to see you then or perhaps we'll talk before then yeah cool cool it looks like lewis has his hand raised with the next question Hey Jim, uh, interesting talk. Cool to cool to see it all come together. Um, I I have sort of, if you'll forgive me, a, a methods -y question, you know, related to sort of structural equation modeling, which I know you didn't uh, derive yourself. So uh, feel free to not defend it if you want to. But um, I guess I I just like to get your take on it as a method for determining like the direction of causality of these relationships because that's that's its big strength right but you look at the method and it doesn't you know looks still pretty naive i just i find it hard to understand how you how you make like a user decision about the directionality beforehand is it all just based on um you know prior information from the literature or i guess what's your what's your general take on on SEM for, for this type of uh, causal relationship work. 
Yeah, Lewis, thanks for asking. I love that question. I, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've talked with different people about it and, you know, like I'm not the only, you know, you and I are not the only people confused about how much to lean into the causal interpretation. So like, I think it was in methods, this issue that there was a Tony Ives like perspective about random effects. And, you know, he ends with sort of like a paragraph about like basically about causality and structural equation models. And, you know, he like a lot of people are like, hey, there's this whole literature on, you know, identifying causality from observational data, like we should look into it. You know, I have, I have a friend, Sergi, who, who actually used a bunch of experiments with Facebook, you know, data experiments on people on Facebook. And, you know, all of the kind of machine learning causality detection methods fall over. I, you know, I'm kind of skeptical about trying to have a real causal interpretation of the output of SEM. And so instead I kind of, you know, the way I want to write it up is like, either it's pragmatic, like there's sort of this whole thing, like Owen Hamel and Jason Cope have these sort of longevity to predicting M, but if you're missing longevity, you predict it from M and K. And so you could get that sort of predictive behavior with a particular structure of a SEM where M over K drive longevity and that drives M. And that means that there's the partial correlation of zero. It's all, you know, the, the in SEM lit, the longevity is the blocking variable. And so you can get these sort of predictive, you can get this model predictive behavior you want with a certain path diagram without endorsing it as a causal model. Um, and then the other reason is like, you know, I, like I said, I get emailed, there's this group in Australia that's gotten a big tiff about the steepness predictions from fish life that are kind of low for a taxa. And I forget which, it, it, which species it is now actually, but there's like, um, you know, stakeholders that are emailing me and, you know, in fish life, which is the same structure, it's phylogenetic trait imputation. It's similar to our phylopars. You know, you get this covariance matrix, but it's really hard to understand why it's predicting something. And so um, if we pretend, you know, if we use a path diagram, we can interpret what the model's doing better. But again, I think we can do that without endorsing the kind of causal interpretation. Um, so I guess I, in the talk, I tried to note the causal interpretation because I think there are cases where we have long-term evolutionary experiments or other real evidence about some of those paths. And we could even use the SEM framework to fix some of those coefficients at an experimental value and then partial that out and then estimate parameters conditional on that. Um, so I think there, I don't think it's like a waste of time to think about it, but I'm pretty skeptical too about the causal interpretation. Great, it makes sense. I'm just, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm not missing the magic or something. You get this great benefit for, for basically giving up nothing. Um, but I guess, I guess, yeah, another spin on it would be, like, I think it's useful that, you know, you, you change the framework so that you get a regression coefficient. So you're in a, you know, regression world rather than correlation. But I guess if you, if realism was, your number one priority, you know, you really have a framework where some things could be correlative and some things could be more causative, totally. right? Yeah, I mean, I, like, I thought, I thought with some people about, like, you know, like, the sibling, you know, experiments and stuff where you could fix some of the co coefficients, and it's like, there's some kind of scaling stuff that I don't fully trust in that either, you know, scaling from couple generation to kind of ecological settings. And, you know, the, the other setting about SCMs is I want to put them in VAST. And, you know, we've got sort of experimental studies with, you know, like fake corals, you know, you know, like in the Caribbean, you know, pe people put out cement blocks and see how that affects densities. And you could, you know, there's sort of a bi-directional thing of like structure to density and density to structure. And if you could experimentally estimate one of those, you could use it to back out the other one. Um, so, I mean, I'm kind of like hopeful that it'll yield something causal in the next decade from somebody doing a clever experiment, but yeah, we're definitely, I definitely try not to like overhype that side. Okay. Well, we're getting close to the end of the hour. Thank you, Rich. And thank you, Lewis, for your questions. Um, if you guys want to chat more with Jim, we can. Hang out for a few more minutes if Jim uh, is okay with that. But otherwise, we'll we will end the seminar here.
And don't forget, you can get the recording of the seminar from our webpage. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, see you next week. Thanks, everyone. And uh, Sarah and Bianca, did you see any other people indicating they wanted to ask questions or? Okay. Nope. Nope. Okay, cool. Well, we're ending on time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jim. <laughs>